Hello, my name is Joanna Pawelczyk. I work at the Faculty of English at Adam Mickiewicz University in Poznań. I am a sociolinguist. I am interested in how we use language in various social contexts and also how we draw on language to enact various types and aspects of our identities. Today, I'll talk on why and how nice comments may feel sexist. More specifically, in this presentation, I will focus on women's experiences. And this is what I'm going to talk about today. I'll start with looking at the phrase that I used in the title of my presentation, that is, oh, you almost throw like a guy. And here I will discuss the importance of context. Then I will move on to talk about experiences and consequences when people function as minorities in organizations, that is, what it's like to be an, a minority. Then we will do a little bit of theory, but not too much. We'll look at gender harassment, because this is the topic of our conversation today. And I'll talk especially how women who have experienced gender harassment, how they talk about it. And here you have an indication of it in the phrase, little things here and there. And finally, we will wrap up the conversation today trying to answer the question how we, can become, how we can become more sensitive and respectful speakers in our everyday conversations. Okay, so let's start with the phrase that you can also see in the title of my presentation, oh, you almost throw like a guy. Now, looking at it, you might think, well, there's nothing really wrong with it. It's a perfect sentence. Uh, we have a comparison, like a guy, and the phrase starts with uh, the particle O, oh, and we know from research that O oh, very often indicates that we have just learned something new, that, that our cognition has changed, that we have just acquired a new piece of knowledge. And you might think that there is nothing wrong with this particular phrase because it is taken completely out of the context. And I'll talk about context in a moment, but before I do that, I want to tell you that this particular uh, sentence, uh, this particular phrase was given, was produced by one of the women I interviewed during my research stay at the U.S. Naval Academy uh, a year ago. And it was a student, a woman student um, at the academy. We refer to these students as women midshipmen. And as you can imagine, being a woman at a military service academy might be a bit of a lonely experience. So she talked about her experiences and the experiences of her friends functioning in this organization. And she, just to give me a sense what it's like, she just said this, the, the following thing. And I'll share with you a longer conversation in a moment, but first let's take a look at, um, and let's try to think why possibly this phrase could be insulting. So, like I said, we need to consider the context. And we very often say that context is everything. But what does it actually mean when we say that context is everything? And we need context to really declare whether a particular phrase might be offensive or not. Okay, so what needs to be considered is who said a particular phrase and to whom. But this is still very general. And by kind of unpacking the who, we need to look at people's gender identities, for example. Um, are they women? Are they men? We should also consider the importance of age as a very important social category. We should also look into ethnicity, whether ethnicity could play a role here in how people uh, interpret a particular phrase. So all of these categories might be very important. What also should be considered is the, the, the context in terms of where a particular phrase was uttered, it was produced, in what circumstances, was there an audience or not. We should also look into the when as well as power relations because power relations very often determine the extent uh, to, to which uh, people might feel a bit offended uh, or not. So context is, is very important. And also, um, what I have found is that it's really important to listen to how the addressees of the messages feel about what has been uttered, what has been produced uh, toward them. So um, that, that is also something I want to make a point of. Now, um, I mentioned that I did my research at the United States Naval Academy, so I just want to show you uh, a couple of pictures just to give you a sense of the place. 
And also I mentioned that I had uh, a privilege to talk to women midshipmen. You have one um, such a, a woman here represented um, in, in the picture. And uh, again, as you may imagine, women um, constitute a minority uh, in this organization. And uh, it, more specifically, women constitute 25% of the student population at the U.S. Naval Academy. So again, that gives you a sense of the experiences they might be facing on a daily basis. Okay, and now I promise to give you a longer, I mean, a bigger context for the phrase that I heard that is, oh, you almost throw like a guy. So here is a part of my conversation with Kathy. It's a pseudonym that I'm using. And uh, Kathy, during our talk, um, when I asked her, what is it like to be a woman at a United States Naval Academy? She said that it's okay, but she hears some little comments here and there. So as you can see, I wanted to find out more about it. So I asked her, you mentioned the little comments here and there. That's interesting. Do you hear these little comments often? And Kathy says, we just had a discussion in my company. There is a main kind of theme going on. Females in my company feel most uncomfortable usually from the accumulation of small comments. So, so what is she talking about? She's talking about small comments, and it's a very interesting juxtaposition, small comments and the accumulation of it. So you can imagine that she's surrounded with these comments on a daily basis. But I still wanted to find out more. What are these comments? What's the content? So I asked the question, what are these comments? And Kathy continues, yes, so sometimes it's something like, um, let me think. It's like, like in reference to one of the females that was a basketball player previously, she went to go um, play with some other guys in the company. And it was like, oh, you almost throw like a guy. And it was like, oh, you play really well. Kind of like surprised, um, you know. There is common sometimes, um, little things here and there. So she's talking about the experiences of being compared to her male counterparts, basically on a daily basis, in terms of small comments, little comments happening here and there. But from this description, we can already understand that these comments, although they are phrased as small, they do play a very important role and how they might be functioning, that is the women midship, and how they might be functioning in this particular organization. So now I'd like to explore the question of what it's like to be and to feel um, a minority. And I'd like to start with an excerpt from a book by Michelle Obama, uh, her autobiography entitled Becoming. The book came out in 2018. It's a great book to read as well. But um, in the book, um, Michelle Obama is recalling her experiences of being the first lady, but in particular being the first and the only so far African-American first lady. And this is what she says. I understood already that I'd be measured by different yardstick. As the only African-American first lady to set foot in the White House, I was other almost by default. If there was a presumed grace assigned to my white predecessors, I knew it wasn't likely to be the, the same for me. I had learned through the campaign, stumbles, that I had to be better, faster, smarter, and stronger than ever. My grace would need to be earned. Now, Michelle Obama, as being the first African-American first lady and also being an African-American woman, is talking about the experience that I heard from, from many women functioning as, a minor, as minorities in organizations or institutions. That is the idea that they had to prove themselves before being accepted. So here, Michelle Obama <clears throat> is talking about being better, faster, smarter, and stronger. So that gives you an idea of the type of challenge that she was that she was facing. Now, continuing the African American context, now a book by um, Dr. Tsadala Malaku that came out last year. You don't look like a lawyer: um, Black women and systemic gender racism. And uh, Dr. Um, Malaku is. Um, talking about the experience of African-American women who are lawyers and who are very often faced with comments that express disbelief that they are actually lawyers. And here I'm referring to um, um, a, a, a quotation example from her presentation 
when she's uh, talking about the experience of an African-American woman, third year associate, so a serious lawyer, and this is what she said. I was in the elevator with ex-partner, and he thought I was a secretary. That happens all the time. I think it's the little things like that. The head of the firm, whenever he comes here, he sits on the floor every time he mistakes me for a secretary, every single time. When you see my white male colleague, you do not assume that he is support staff. You just don't do it. So what should be catching our attention here is just that this woman is actually saying that the experience of being faced with the comment, you don't look like a lawyer, uh, is not really happening you know, from time to time. It's not you know, a, a big surprise. It's, it's actually something that she's experiencing every day. And what is important is that her um, white male colleagues do not face that type of comment. So there is a big difference. Now, my next example, uh, or examples rather, come from a book entitled Brotopia. So we have a very nice blend of brother and utopia here. Breaking up the Boys Club of Silicon Valley. Um, this is a book that talks about the experiences of women in the IT business in the Silicon Valley. And the author of the book, Emily Chang, um, is saying that, yes, of course, we know it, that women faced overt sexism and sexual harassment. But she's also referring to what we already heard in today's presentation, that is little comments, small comments that we heard from women midshipmen. So this is what Chang, Chang says. Women in tech are held back not only by overt sexism and sexual harassment, but also by less obvious and still dangerous patterns of behavior that are difficult to pinpoint and call out. So she's saying that these little comments, the small comments, are less obvious, but still very, very dangerous. And what is important is, is that it's difficult to identify them and to call out. And you will hear this problem with identification in the way women who have experienced gender harassment talk about it. Now, uh, Chang is also referring to her conversation with uh, Cheryl, Cheryl Sandberg, uh, who is currently um, Chief um, Operation Officer at Facebook. And Cheryl Sandberg said the following. Women are held back by a lot of things, including sexual discrimination and harassment. In addition, a lot of what's hurting women now are the insidious, constant, smaller thing. So again, we hear sexual harassment, sexual discrimination, but then Sandberg is also talking about these sort of low-level, low indirect aspects of harassment. And to continue, every day things happen that can really quickly add up. Maybe your boss interrupts you or gives credit for your ideas to someone else. It is difficult to explain because often the boss isn't even aware of the behavior. So we're learning from this example three things. One thing we already know, that um, gender harassment takes the form of kind of um, indirect and, and low-level um, uh, form. But she also gives us an example of these small things, of these smaller things. She says that, for example, your boss keeps interrupting you, okay, or, for example, gives credit for your ideas to someone else. And what is even more important, she says that the boss himself might not be sometimes aware of that type of behavior. So it has been internalized uh, for a long time. It, it's something that the boss has been socialized into. So I hope that what we are seeing is that gender harassment is taking um, the indirect, subtle forms. Gender harassment is also known, is also referred to as everyday sexism, everyday challenges, daily hustle, daily hassles, daily insults, and gender microaggressions. And I think that looking at these names gives us a sense of the different forms, sort of as if an anatomy of gender harassment. So it's happening every day. Um, it's a challenge. It's a hassle. It's an insult. And also, it's a microaggression. So it's taking place at the micro level of our interactions. Now, I also would like to emphasize here that it's really important to name problems, to have a name for a certain issue, for a certain problem. Because if we don't have a name, it's not something that can be talked about or it can be dealt with. And we cannot really think of solutions. So, Problems need, to be problems need to be named. 
Okay, I said that one of the interesting things, especially for researchers, is to look into how women report on their experiences of gender harassment. And I'd like to continue here with my um, examples from my research um, at uh, U.S. Naval Academy. And these are two excerpts, again, that give us a sense of how gender harassment is framed, how it is talked about. So in the first one, um, one of the women midshipmen said, I think I've heard and had like bits and pieces of commentary at times. It's kind of like, why are you doing this? So it's interesting that again, we don't have a specific example. We have the reference of bits and pieces of commentary at times. And generally, it all narrows down to why you're doing this. So why are you, what are you doing here as a woman at a military service academy? And in the second example, another uh, woman midshipman says, I felt that everything has been pretty much neutral towards me. It's just these small events that sometimes pop up that kind of make me realize, oh, I'm a female here. So in a similar vein, she's talking about small events that sometimes pop up, so they happen very unexpectedly, which means that you, you're not really prepared how to react to them and what to do about them, but we'll talk about reaction and taking action in a moment. Now, I'd like to draw your attention to a project that's been going on for some time, and you can look it up on the website. It's entitled the Everyday Sexism Project that was set up by um, Laura Bates in 2014. And uh, it collects the stories of both women and men who experience sexism. What's interesting, and you can see the different flags at the bottom, uh, sorry, at the top of the page, is that um, we have representation here of, of many countries. So the stories are also interesting in terms of cross cross-cultural aspects of sexism. So it's something, you know, interesting to, to look into. So to kind of wrap it up, this part of our discussion, I hope that I was able to show you that gender harassment takes very subtle forms. It's very covert. It's very low level and kind of less obvious. However, gender harassment belongs to a bigger concept that is sexual harassment. And what is important, and I'd like to emphasize it, is that sexual harassment is a continuum of exclusionary behaviors. So on the one hand of the on the on the one end of the continuum we have gender harassment, and on the other we have sexual assault. So those are as if stages. And I'm really making a point here of looking at sexual harassment as a continuum of exclusionary behaviors because sometimes I hear comments um, that, for example, well, you know, we have some problems with gender harassment, but at least we don't have any incidents of sexual assault. And I object to it because, as you can see, it's a continuum. So if, if you have in your organization, in your institution, problems with gender harassment, you might actually expect some, let's say, other aspects of harassment, such as sexual assault, for example, somewhere at, you know, at some point, okay? So it's simply, you know, you, what I'm trying to say is that you can't really make a distinction that there is, you know, let's say better violence and worse violence, that violence is simply violence, but we have different degree of it. So again, um, a continuum of exclusionary behaviors. Now, such an exclusionary behavior or such harassing behavior would be street harassment. And I'd like to illustrate it with an excerpt from a book by Siri Hustvedt entitled A Woman Looking at Men, Looking at Women, Essays on Art, Sex, and the Mind. And here's an excerpt. Um, the author, Siri Hustvedt, is talking about her experiences of being a student and, and really being engrossed in her studies. And she used to take walks during the, during the afternoons. And this is what she says. But in those days, when I left my apartment to take a walk, I was often roused from my amnesia, so the amnesia was caused obviously by her being so much involved in, in reading and writing. So she was roused, uh, I was often roused from my amnesia by the ubiquitous stare that belonged to no men in particular, but to many men all at once, and which accompanied me down the street. And I remember, for, I remember that all that gazing at my body in motion had a stiffening effect on my limbs because it turned a simple stroll into an unwilling performance and I feigned deafness when bursts of obscene commentary came from one side or the other. I supposed they wanted me to blush. I didn't. 
I remember too that I was sometimes commanded to smile by a stranger on the, on the sidewalk. Why so glum, baby? Smile. I think it's a very interesting example because it's a great illustration of a typical street harassment going on. And also on top of that, then, um, you know, she's asked why she's so glum and why she's not really smiling as if this is what is really expected of women, you know, taking walks to smile. So this, this is an example of street harassment. So gender harassment is taking um, the form of crude or offensive remarks or jokes, which I hope you were able to see. It also relates to demeaning comments, as well as banter about a particular member of another gender. It also relates to discrediting remarks about an entire gender, for example, so not, not me specifically, but me representing women as a group. And I think what's also very interesting uh, would be hostile comments signifying that members of a particular gender do not belong. And this is again um, a situation that women who function as minority in very gendered organization, in very masculine organization, this is what they are, uh, the, what they are dealing with or they have to manage on a daily basis. So certain attitudes uh, towards them that, that really show them or indicate to them that they do not really belong to the organization from the start and they have to somehow prove that they are worth being there. And gender harassment also refers to non-sexual threats of intimidation. As you can see, however, I put at the bottom of the page a number of dots because this is not an exhaustive list. I think um, the list will continue because gender harassment is also very much placed and framed in the current political and social climate. So the list simply and unfortunately can go on. Okay, so some of the conclusions that we can now get from what I have already said is that gender harassment is more common and pervasive than sexual harassment. Sexual harassment is this more general, more umbrella term. Women are more likely to experience gender harassment than men. Gender harassment frequently intersects with other forms of harassment, for example, race or sexual orientation. So these can happen at the same time. And also, the more male dominated the work environment, the more women experience the gender harassment form of sexual harassment. What is also important, and we need to emphasize it, is that the experience of gender harassment is very damaging to the individuals who experience it and also to the organization as such. And it is damaging to victims' professional, physiological, psychological, and physiological, physiological outcomes. But the problem is that gender harassment as such is not really recognized by institutions. So these forms of harassment are not something that can be you know, quickly um, oriented to and quickly dealt with. It's not recognized by institution, institutions as actionable form of harassment. So it's mostly, um, you know, when you think about the continuum of exclusionary behaviors that I showed you, so typically sexual assaults would be something taken care of, but gender harassment, because it's so low level, so indirect, is not really taken care of. And in this sense, it is invisible to the leadership of an, of an organization. If it's, and if it's, you know, invisible to the leadership, it's simply not dealt with. Um, one of the issues, and again, something I already mentioned today, but what interests me um, as a researcher, researcher is that individuals who are reporting or talking about these experiences, they ra rarely, you know, label such behaviors in this manner as, as gender harassment, right? Rather, what we saw, gender harassment is framed in very, very general terms. And now I'd like to ask the question, Okay, so how can we become more sensitive and respectful speakers? What can we do? And I'd like to give you some three important tips, but also principles in a way. So first of all, we need to remember that as speakers, um, as people who communicate, as communicators, we know very little about how we use language and what kind of speakers we are. So we know very little about the type of, you know, reality scenarios we are creating with our word choice, you know, with the way we use language in, in general. So there is a gap between our actual language use, how we talk on a daily basis, and, or versus, 
how we perceive ourselves. So we might typically perceive ourselves, you know, in, in a better light than what we actually do, okay? So we might say, you know, I, I will never ever say anything offensive, but in fact, you might not really be aware of that. And I'd like to illustrate now the gap between actual linguistic performance and our ideas about what, what, you know, what kind of speakers we are um, with a study by Louise Maloney uh, entitled Gender Discourses in the Professional Workplace. And uh, Dr. Maloney in this study looked at female managers in a, a very masculine type of organization. And uh, in particular, she was focusing on the linguistic performance of Amy. And um, Amy, as a female manager, was a very successful communicator because um, we could uh, see that in her daily interactions, she was mixing what is typically referred to as masculine and, and feminine uh, communicative style. So she was able to, you know, to switch and to mix it and, and people really like it. Um, so as you can see, Amy utilized a wide variety of interactional styles, including stereotypically masculine as well as a range of stereotypically feminine linguistic strategies. And, and like I said, people were very happy with the conversations they had with Amy. However, when Dr. Maloney sat down with Amy to ask her, you know, what kind of speaker are you and, you know, what do you talk like in, in, your, daily, uh, in your daily interactions, Amy said the following, I talk and act more like a man in many of my behavioral roles because of what I've worked with in the past. I'm less approachable than some of the men, but I think I'm probably unique in that respect, I think. I'm not your typical female manager, and some people find that hard. And I think it's a great illustration to really see that how Emmy perceives herself is that she thinks her style um, is what we refer to as very masculine type of conversation. And she even thinks that this is what her colleagues make of her or think of her. So the gap is there and it's something we should be aware of. And in connection with that, my second thought is that we need to, to become more respectful and sensitive uh, speakers, we need to use self-reflexive language. And what it means that in our daily conversations, we need to be aware of what we do with language, but also we need to be aware, be aware of others. So again, what kind of reality are we constructing by how we're using language and how we communicate with others? And I'd like to emphasize that this awareness should not really occur, you know, after the fact, but we should be in a way proactive, that is, before we actually, you know, say something or before we actually engage fully in a, in, in a conversation. So sensitivity is something that is highly recommended. And uh, Google's former longtime head and senior vice president of people operations, Lashla Bok, said the following, that the reality is that without support or training, nobody is completely fair and unbiased. And I think that gives us another piece of evidence that self-reflexivity is so much important in our conversations. And thirdly, and this is, I think, the biggest challenge, we need to react and we need to take action. And I'd like to start with a quotation from my research when uh, one of the women midshipmen commented on what happens when they're trying to react and they're trying to let their uh, male colleagues know, you know, you said something that I'm not happy with, um, and you said something that makes me feel very uncomfortable. Okay, so here it goes. But you know, sometimes it's like the little, the little things that build up and then people feel uncomfortable. And then a lot of times when we bring it up, like, okay, we want something to stop. It, it's kind of seemed like a joke. They're like, oh, okay, fine. Maybe they will stop for a little bit, but it's the collective that everybody, you know, would have to stop, we have to stop it then. So maybe one person might for a little bit, but everybody else is still doing it or a couple of people stop for a little bit and then they go like forget and go back to their habits. So what we can see here is that, you know, it's a lot of emotional labor to react, to say something, but then you're really met with a lot of resistance. People say, okay, fine, you know, you're oversensitive. I didn't mean that. And maybe they stop with such comments for a moment, but then they go back. However, I can tell you, and again, I'm, I'm 
referring to my own work um, at, uh, at this particular institution, that it's so important to keep reacting because you pr you're probably not successful the first time and it's going to take some time, but it's going to make a difference in the end. So react and take action, and that also should be um, a call to organizations because they should be aware that constant exposure to gender harassment can be just as damaging to women as the most egregious form, so the most horrible forms of sexual harassment. And this is actually something I've taken from Harvard uh, Business, Business Review. So again, you have to, or it's recommended that you react as an individual, but the institution you're in, the organization you're in, you're in should also take some action. And last but not least, Reaction is needed because otherwise gender harassment can be accepted as normal part of working life. And again, an excerpt from Harvard Business Review, um, and I think it's a great illustration what happens when we don't react. So this is a, a, con this is a situation when we have um, one person, a man, who, who you know keeps producing quite um, insulting comments, but there is you know, nothing is happening, nobody is reacting. So here it goes. But no one says anything. Co-workers may laugh uncomfortably at his jokes or ignore them. Maybe they will warn a new employee to stay away from him, maybe not. Everybody's watching and nobody's doing anything about it. So the message the perpetrator gets is, my behavior is normal and natural. No one's telling him, I don't think you should do that. Instead, they're telling the new intern don't go into the copy room with him. It's all about risk aversion, which we know, though, through decades of research on rape prevention, does not stop perpetrators from perpetrating. So you have a very, you know, um, uncomfortable situation here when the perpetrator keeps, you know, producing these comments and behaving in, in a very inappropriate way, um, but nothing is done about his behavior, rather, co-workers are warned, you know, stay away from this particular person. So again, reaction is really, really necessary. You also need to address the issue of reporting incidents of sexual harassment. Now, research shows us that when harassment is reported by a co-worker acting as a bystander, so somebody who has witnessed such an act, the woman who was sexually harassed is not negatively perceived in an organization. And I think this is another example of, of why reporting and why actually uh, bringing attention to such incidents is really, really important, including people who are uh, observers of such situations. Okay, to um, wrap it up, as my um, concluding thought, I'd like to say that change can only come from having not very comfortable discussions about the experiences of people in an organization. So, these negative experiences need to be talked about. Um, they have to be dealt with because that can only lead to change. And I'd like to leave you with a very positive aspect, a change. Um, as you can see, this, this is the vice uh, president-elect, um, Senator um, Kamala Harris, and she's casting the shadow of um, um, social activist Ruby Bridges. And I think it's a very powerful picture that all the little girls should be um, familiar with. Thank you very much.